Welcome to SoFlo by Lucas Millar. <laughs> Lucas's latest collection of 13 short stories, ranging from the gross and silly to heart wrenching thrillers of cosmic proportions. Join Lucas as he takes you beyond the beaches and shows you the dark side of the Sunshine State. Welcome to SoFlo, a collection of weird Florida horror by Lucas Millar. Available January 14th, 2024. Brought to you by the Evil Cookie Publishing. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Dead Headspace. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my friend Brian LaFaro. Say hello, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And our other friend, Candice Nola. Say hello, Candice. Hello. And today we are joined from... A uh, return and guest, Wub Gishig Rice. Say hello, Wub. Hey, Patrick, Brennan, and Candice. Great to be with you all t- today. When you were, the first time you were on was uh, season two, episode 81. We're on episode 237. It's only been two years. <laughs> so what's what's happened, man, from then? I know you got a new beautiful son. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, a new book, but. Is there anything in particular you would like to discuss? Just wow, the passage of time is worth discussing for sure. <laughs> you know what? Uh, what a trip to consider how long it's been and uh, what's all gone on in all of our lives since then, right? But um, I think that's a, a really cool opportunity just to you know be thankful for everything in our lives when we look back in those you know, chunks of time. And uh, yeah, and it, since then, as you mentioned, a new little boy, a new book that just came out. And uh, I'm just grateful for the journey ongoing. How does it feel? Because I don't even know if you were, I, I don't remember you mentioning even the idea of a sequel. I could be wrong. It's been a couple of years, but I, I don't recall you talking about it at all. When did the idea come to you? Yeah, if if we did talk about it, it probably would have only been in passing. Uh, the the idea or the opportunity first came up in in late 2019, but it wasn't a sure thing until uh, you know early to mid 2020 uh, is when I had an offer to to get it done. And I think if you know at that point when we talked that was probably underway but like you know just in the early developmental phase right and you all know as as creators when those things are just forming you don't want to reveal too much or discuss too much around them for worry of like derailing yourself ultimately right hmm. uh so yeah the, the sequel would have been underway when we talked last time but it definitely was not as fully formed as uh it could have been to talk about it publicly you know so for those that are unfamiliar with what we're talking about, uh, his first book, Moon of the Crusted Snow, phenomenal book, apocalypse book, uh, told in, and can you please pronounce the tribe name? Cause I feel like I'm going to butcher it. Oh yeah. No worries. Uh, then the Shnabe people, uh, it's, uh, you know, part of my heritage. That's, uh, my dad's, uh, lineage. I grew up in an Anishinaabe community on Georgian Bay, uh, here on the Great Lakes on the Ontario side. And the Anishinaabe people more or less are around all of the Great Lakes. You know, our, our region is quite vast um, on both sides of the border uh, between what's now Canada and the United States. And uh, yeah, I, I proudly represent uh, our people and our stories and just very grateful for the opportunity to write about our experiences. Now, with Moon of the Crust of Snow, you, I, I forget what it's called, but there is something in Canada I know other parts of like Europe, I don't know where else in the world where you can apply for something with the government to basically fund the, the finances on the book is, Hmm. is that what you, didn't you do that with the first one? Oh yeah. You know, ever since uh, I explored becoming an author, grants were a big part of it. And, And I think up here in Canada and yeah, in a lot of European countries too, you know, that there are, there are strong public arts funding initiatives like uh, granting programs um, both from the federal government and from provincial governments 
and you know it's not a huge amount of money like it's not like you're gonna you know be set for years to write a book but it's enough to like allow you to focus on writing for a few months at a time to maybe take a leave from your day job and and just be a full-time author and i really had uh fortunate opportunities to do that while i was working as a journalist for the cbc um, but for years ago, I, I made the leap into full time writing and, and yeah, grants were a part of that, too. You know, that enabled and empowered me to, yeah, focus on moving of the turning leaves entirely for, uh, yep, yeah, all up until it got published. It's so cool, man. I, I don't think that's a thing in the States. Yeah, you know, I've, I've talked to some American colleagues and, and there are, are some uh, arts funding initiatives, but, you know, they're, from what I've heard, they're more geared towards, um, you know, authors in like mid to later stages of their careers, I guess. Whereas up here, you know, if you're an emerging writer, you can apply for a grant and, and that money is earmarked directly for that, right? It's, wow. it's you know, hoping to get people kickstarted into the industry. So I, I do know there are programs down there, um, but uh, not as as extensive as up here for sure. That's pretty cool. Um, I just want to throw this out there. If you look up for anyone else that's interested in in Web uh this or the previous episode with us, there's you got a lot of interviews. I mean, when you were a journalist, but even now as an author specifically, uh, there's one really neat one. Uh, with the Toronto Public Library. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what it means to just like, because for me, like as a kid, like my dream would be to have like, you know, my books and whatnot in the Boston area because that, yeah, I'm from Massachusetts. So like that would be a big deal for me. For you, is uh, Toronto, I know, is uh, your everything. That's your Mecca. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to know how it feels that like you can bring your kids to, the library and be like dad's got some books there how, how does that feel man uh it's so special you know it's it's a dream come true uh and also a dream that you know probably would have seemed well beyond reach when i was much younger you know uh so to have opportunities to to be on shelves is is just the coolest thing and then to have my kids who are now old enough to be aware of you know tangible books and who's written them and what they're about and then having their dad uh you know have his face and name on on books that are easily accessible is is pretty awesome so uh yeah and and you know that Toronto Public Library event uh, last fall was super cool you know Toronto is the biggest city uh closest to us it's where I went to university back in the day and um you know it really is the hub of you know the literary world here in canada for sure right mm -hmm. um and the toronto public library that branch the downtown one is just you know a foundational sort of um, mecca as you said right for for the literary arts so that in film it. yeah in film too yeah absolutely yeah. um so yeah it was super cool to be able to do that right on man i've hogged enough air time why don't we go to you kansas <laughs> Okay, so why don't we talk a little bit about the um, storyline, and since this is actually on part two of it, could you actually talk about the first part real quick and then give us a little bit about what part two is about for anyone that may or may not have read part one before we talk about part two? Yeah, for sure. And and yeah, it's great to have you here, Candice. Uh, I knew Thank you remember the last time I was here, right? So this is awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, fir the first book, Moon of the Crescent Snow, it's about uh, a small remote, remote uh, Anishinaabe reserve in northern Ontario that endures um, a mysterious blackout. You know, suddenly uh, cell phones go out, electricity goes out. Um, they're cut off from the world to the south. And this community uh, is, is difficult to access. You know, most of the time people fly into it, but there's also some service roads that people can uh, use to get up there. And, and it's a few hundred kilometers north of the closest city. Um, so because people there, though, uh, you know, live off the land, they're able to hunt and, and harvest um, what they need from the natural world around them. Uh, having a blackout isn't an immediate crisis. They're able to sort of adapt and keep themselves warm and fed and so on, right? But, you know, with anybody, uh, as the weeks go on, things would get more tense 
and you know the order starts to unravel slightly as people mm -hmm. get a little hungry and you know want answers and so on and then all of a sudden uh, some unexpected visitors come up on snowmobiles from a city to the south and these are people led by one person initially who are seeking refuge safety on the reservation uh mm -hmm. in the midst of this crisis and that sort of upsets the balance in this community and then the people there are are forced to make some tough decisions about you know welcoming mm -hmm. these people in what to do about them and their future and it ultimately becomes a story of, of renewal because this blackout you know is a blessing in disguise of sorts it's an opportunity for these indigenous people to to get back to the land and and sort of mm -hmm. hit the reset button right um, so these things unfold and then it comes to, you know, a, a big sort of um, conflict and without giving too, too much away uh, yeah. towards the end, um, they create a, a newer settlement for themselves away from okay. the reserve site. Right. So part two picks up uh, 10 years after they moved to this new settlement. And they've been in this place for so long that they recognize a lot of the uh, natural resources around them are starting to dwindle. They're not able to harvest as much food from the land. And they recognize that traditionally their ancestors would have been migratory. They would have traveled from place to place to, to hunt and fish and gather from the bush and so on. So they decide that maybe it's time to finally move on uh, to allow the land to replenish itself and also to seek out the world to the south to see if, in fact, it has ended, you know, to see who's survived and so on. And also, it's explained in the first book that uh, they were this community was originally displaced from the Great Lakes to far northern Ontario. And part of this quest is to see if they can return to their original homelands down on uh, the Great Lakes there. So, yeah, uh, the first book is about a uh, moment of crisis and the struggle between good and evil and the immediate aftermath. And the second book is more or less a quest story, you know, to explore the world as it's uh, sort of rebuilding itself and uh, the place of all people in a renewed world. Mm -hmm. Nice. So... This is another one that I like to ask a lot. So was there a part of this that you found be more of a struggle to write compared to either part one or the rest of the actual storyline? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, as mentioned, like, I see the first story, Moon of the Crested Snow, as a pretty straightforward one, right? Like that struggle mm -hmm. between good and evil, as I mentioned. Uh, and the second one, because it's set farther into the future, um, it, it was more of a speculative story. And mm -hmm. I did have to sort of imagine uh, the world then, you know, what would happen to towns and cities, you know, after the collapse, you know, a decade plus into the future. Uh, but more of a challenge was considering you know, the, I guess the, the, how moral lines are blurred after survival becomes the ultimate goal for all people, no matter who mm -hmm. they are, right? So it, that was a little more interesting to sort of explore and, and to really boil down. Uh, but I think the toughest thing overall was, I was like, okay, this is going to be a quest story. They're going to walk through the bush for a summer, how interesting is it to follow people as they walk through the bush, you know, <laughs> until right. they encounter other people, right? So right. that was the biggest challenge is like upping the tension as they're mysteriously traversing this 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 landscape, right? So, um, but I had a great editor who really helped me pump up those parts, and um, and and in the end, I, I you know I was satisfied with how it the the end result ultimately. Yeah. So one more before I kick it over to one of my fellow co-hosts, and I like this one a lot because I know who I would pick, but do you have a favorite favorite character in this part of the book? Yeah, for Moon of the Turning Leaves, it's definitely Nangos, the daughter. Um, so yeah. Yes. yeah, I like her. Yeah, I mean, I okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she was she was super fun to write. Uh, you know, um, when when I started dreaming up part two, you know, Evan, the the dad, you know, the main character in part one mm. was, was going to be there again. And because he was older and the kids were, were older, I thought, yeah, I want one of the kids to be part of this quest. Yeah. And I think, you know, the trope 
more commonly is to have the son be part of the quest, you know, make it like a father son buddy adventure story. Mm -hmm. But that didn't really interest me at all because that story has been done so much. Right. And, and, you know, I, I felt like if I did it that way, I'd potentially alienate a lot of, a lot of women, you know, uh, yeah. and, and I, I felt it was my responsibility to try to create a strong female lead character. So that really was the motivation behind making Nangos one of the one of the core um, uh, characters, right? And and yeah, it's really tough, you know, being a man in your forties and writing from the perspective of a fifteen-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thankfully, you know, I got a lot of nieces and younger cousins who, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with a lot, and uh, I understand what their objectives are for their lives and how they view the world and what's important to them and so on. So I was able really to mold Nungos from all those different experiences of people who I know. Um, and yeah, it was just you know, just exciting to have her lead the way as they went on this uh, journey of discovery. Yeah, I really liked her a lot. And I feel Thank like you. you you were like spot on with her. Oh, thanks. Just, yeah. yeah. Because I knew, I think, I um, maybe within the first chapter where she was kind of like a main part of it. I was like, that's the girl that I'm going to follow through this <laughs> story because she, yeah. Yeah, I liked her a lot. So, cool. Brennan, anyone over there before I continue? No, well, I will jump in with pleasure. Thank you. Um, well, speaking of the, uh, the um, Moon of the Crusted Snow, when we had talked last time, one of one of my favorite aspects of it is the isolation, the way that you told an apocalyptic story without telling about the apocalypse, if you will. Um, and I wonder if now that, you know, you've written Moon of the Turning Leaves, where by necessity, we're kind of expanding that world, what kind of considerations you put into that with, you know, the pressure, I suppose, of having to explain more versus just be an observer? Oh, th that was a big part of the uh, the research and development for sure. You know, uh, I purposely left out the cause of the blackout in the first one because that was intriguing to me. Uh, I I enjoy post-apocalyptic stories that don't uh, reveal what the cause of the end of the world is. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to imagine what it could be on your own as a reader, I think. Right. And, and I wanted to offer something similar in moon of the crested snow. So I always knew what the cause of the blackout was uh, in moon of the crested snow, but I didn't tell anybody about it. Didn't tell my editor. I didn't even tell my wife, you know, because I felt like if I mentioned this somehow, it's going to get out there and then that's going to sort of taint people's imagination of, of, of the story and of what the cause of the blackout could be. And then when the time came to work on the second book, I thought, you know, if people read a whole other novel and still don't know what the cause is or what any of the answers are, they're going to be pretty pissed off at me, you know? <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta reveal, you know, what I think the cause of this blackout is. Um, but I wanted to show it more as like a, a domino effect, you know, and, and as you read Moon of the Turning Leaves, you see that there are, are a few things that happen after the power goes out, like sickness and nuclear meltdowns and, and stuff like that, right? And just the general chaos of the collapses of society, you know? Um, so at the same time, I, I thought because these, these main characters have been so isolated, they're coming in way after the fact. And they're really not getting many firsthand accounts of what happened in the end of the world. And, and they're sort of unsure what's true and what isn't, right? Um, there's, they're trying to piece everything together. And, and I think that's, you know, realistic, for lack of a better word. You know, if you were isolated for that long and you, you, you endured the end of the world and you didn't know what happened, you'd, you'd be forced to pick up the pieces and try to um, imagine, you know, the whole outcome of, of that moment, right? So uh, that was fun to do, but it also required, like, um, some a little bit of scientific research. Uh, and, you know, for, for your listeners who haven't read Moon of the Turning Leaves yet, I won't reveal what the cause is, but, you know... I, once you've read it, you'll know that like you have to sort of have an understanding of how that kind of phenomenon can knock out, you know, it, 
power infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, everything else like that, right? So I had to wrap my head around that before fully committing to it for sure. And I think, you know, as we are typically a podcast that delves into the horror side of things, I think that it's such uh, a component of, of the genre or at least the characteristics of the genre to make those discoveries, to have the characters make those discoveries and hear stories that lead them to conclusions and then hear stories from other surf, um, other s sources that don't quite jive with the you know basically that we're we're hearing essentially these these contrasting ideas that really just make the world a bigger lonelier scarier place with no definitive answer uh you know at, at least at certain stages of the journey yeah and you know you mentioned kind of the making it feel real the authenticity of it and i think i, I think that was a great way to go about it was to oh, almost seed that uh not disinformation, but confusion almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So I am looking at the spine of this and uh, there is a blurb from one of our favorite humans, uh, Amakatsu. And it says, let's hope Wabgeisha Grice doesn't make us wait too long for the next visit to this captivating oh. world. So okay. I'm wondering if Alma knows something that we don't, Alma knows something that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she knows something I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, it, w w what a what a blessing to have an endorsement from her. Um, like I was so surprised when when the my editor uh, let me know about that. Um, but you know, I I don't want to rule out a part three because I originally ruled out a part two when first the first part was uh, coming out. Um, I had no intention of writing a sequel at all, right? And it was due entirely to the enthusiasm of readers uh, that I really took it seriously and started to explore it, right? So um, I have like a really vague idea of what a part three could be, but I kind of want to give it a little time before, you know, diving right into it. And there's some other like more lighthearted things I want to um, try to write first. And I, I know fans of, of your po podcast it wouldn't be in their wheelhouse whatsoever, I don't think. But uh, I need sort of a break from this, you know, post-apocalyptic <laughs> world I've had my head in for almost <laughs> a decade, you know? So, uh, but yeah, you know, just having people, in, you know, so keen on this world and these characters is really the greatest privilege and the greatest honor I could ever have as a storyteller, you know? So I feel like I owe those people another glimpse into the world if they want it. And yeah, it's up to me to work hard to try to give them something worthwhile, you know? So um, in a few years time, I'm definitely going to see if I can develop something for sure. Very cool. Yeah. And that, that was something you kind of touched on it there, but uh, one of the initial questions that Patrick had launched at you was, you know, when when work began in earnest on this, and you have this this line right up the top at the acknowledgments that basically says that the fans of the first book made this this one happen, and I, I do wonder like how much of a factor was that? You know, did you you say you kind of got the gears turning for a potential book three if the response is right but with with book one going into book two was that entirely response were were you thinking and you just weren't sure whether it was a viable option how did that go, go about yeah it's it's interesting you know to to look back on that because i was working full-time as a journalist and you know just having this these passion projects of writing fiction you know in my spare time right and just so fortunate that I was able to get this book done and, and get it published. Moon of the Crested Snow, I mean, right? While I was working uh, full time. And and um, I, I put like all of my creative energy into it, you know, after work or on the weekends or whatever else. And I just thought I totally tapped out the tank with that story. I, I, I didn't really see beyond the ending of it because I thought this is all I'm able to commit to this, you know, and, and I'm happy with it. I'm happy with how the story ends. You know, if, if readers want to imagine what they're doing when they go off into this other place, and that's cool. That that's you know my gift to the readers, and their their reception of it is their gift to me at the same time. Uh, but when I started taking it out to to do like publicity back in in 2018 when it came out, um, people would ask me, you know, uh, hey, this seems like it would make a, a good series. 
Um, you know, uh, have you started working on that? And I would say no, because I was being honest. I wasn't at all. I, I had not considered a sequel, you know? And then I would notice that people would look really disappointed when I told them that. <laughs> and now that, oh man, I got to like massage the truth a little bit and, and just give them something. Right. So I would start saying like, oh yeah, you know, I'm thinking about it, but not really be thinking about it. Right. But I had to really like take a step back and, and and acknowledge that, you know, as as mentioned, that these are people so keen on on the story and this world and these characters that I owe it to them to try again, to try hard. And also, most importantly, I owe it to the characters in the story. I owe it to that world to give them another opportunity to live in a whole other story, right? Uh, and all that combined just felt like such a huge, a huge gift, you know? It was just... Um, so massive to be able to recognize that and think, wow, you know, um, the, the, there's something alive here. You know, there's something, you know, I, and I hate to use the term magical because, you know, I don't even know what magic really is. But uh, there's something magical going on with with readers and this story that, you know, as as the conduit, um, I owe it to everybody to to try again. So that's that's when it really started, I think, turning up emotionally for me. And I think that was really the key was just to have my heart and my spirit in it and, and really think hard about it and, and just feel blessed to be able to do it. You know? Ooh, you know, I almost didn't throw out that question because I felt like you had kind of talked about it a little bit, but I'm real glad I did. Cause that's such an interesting point about, uh, owing it to readers because at the, at the forefront is, you know, it's the art, you got to follow the art, the story that wants to be told, um, and if you've got something that you're passionate about that you want to do, shouldn't that be the thing that you're working on? But at the same time, these are the readers are the people who are, you know, the reason that you get to do like an event like the one we were talking about at the Toronto Library. Uh, they they're the ones that have shouted about and, you know, championed the first book. And if if you can craft a story that continues on in that world that you are confident in and feels like does justice for those characters, then at least a little bit, don't you, you know, don't you owe it to them? That's yeah. really interesting. I, I'm not sure that we've ever had that exact line of conversation before. Well, yeah. And, so. and, you know, it's, it's part of reciprocity, right? Like, you know, as, as creators, we are part of a relationship, you know, we, we give and receive. And, and, and I think um, recognizing that it is something we're building, you know, with readers, with our peers as writers, uh, with, with broadcasters, podcasters, everybody involved in all these discussions, like, it's important to be as accessible as possible, in my opinion, and to really keep those discussions going, because that's what really fuels the storytelling, really fuels the writing, you know, and, and I've just been nothing but energized by all of it. Yeah. Again, I'm really glad we went down this route. This is cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for digging, digging deeper there, Brennan. Uh, yeah, it was great. Certainly. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to throw it to you. I'm just wondering for readers for whatever reason if they were to just pick up book two and for people that don't know can they just enjoy that without knowing anything from from a moon, the moon of crusted snow i think so you know and that was one of the reasons for setting it so far into the future you know you have um a different sort of setting you have older characters, you have new characters in some ways, you know, the ones who are little kids in the first one are young adults in the second one. Um, and, and it's written in a way that like the contextual bits about the first story really aren't like beating you over the head at any point. They're sort of written in a way that they're interspersed throughout like the first part of the first act, essentially, when they're getting ready. And, and as they're walking too, you know, like the, there are revelations that uh, are happening as they're walking through the bush and you learn a bit more about uh, book one. So no, you don't have to read the first book. Um, uh, I, I think it's it's written as a standalone and you can, you know, fully follow what's been happening or what has happened. And, and I think like, I don't think the emotional payoff would be any different if you didn't read the first book, because ultimately... Um, it's more or less the backstory, right? And, and and it's it's really about what happened and how this community came to be in this place. And the second story really is about advancing 
uh, the community and, and really throwing it to the future, which, you know, in some ways was a lot more fun, was a lot more invigorating for me to do as a writer. That's awesome, man. Um, did that take a lot of thought? Like that might be a silly question to ask, but did that take a lot of thought in the sense of I'm going to do it this way and kind of risk people that really clung to the first one. Cause there are, you know, there's some readers that really just are diehards. Um, yeah. Yeah, what, yeah, was there other was there other options for book two? I guess is what I'm asking at the the format, the direction. Yeah, that's a good question. I I think the only other option would have been to pick it up right after the end of book one to to mm. have them, you know, uh, just months later, uh, going on the quest then, um, which you know could have been a viable story, you know, it could have worked, uh, but it was less interesting to me to just you know pick up the same story, you know, um, establish the same sort of pacing, the same sort of atmosphere. Uh, and that's one thing that's, that's really different. I think about the second one and, and, you know, readers of the first one who, who enjoyed like the creepier, more horrific aspects would, would probably find those things a little more drawn out in the second one and maybe not as pronounced as they are in the first one, because they're, they're different lengths too. Like, the first one's only about 220 pages and the second one's 300 plus, right? So there's like a whole additional third of a story there, you know? Um, so there's a lot to a lot to, to tell, a lot to write, you know? And, and it can be challenging to make a story like that, um, especially a quest story, as we mentioned, as we covered, where, you know, for the first third of their quest, they're just going through the bush by themselves, you know? Um, so I, I think that the tone uh, readers of the first one will, will find it a little bit different. Um, but hopefully, you know, what I really tried to capture was the same heart of the people and really the same spirit of the landscape, too, that they try to tap into as they go on this quest. And, and you know, it's a while before anything really horrific or, or creepy happens. But, you know, for me. Uh, I was writing towards those moments as, as you know, hard signposts and and really like, um, I think enjoyable narrative goals when when we get to those points where we see some some violence or some some really scary uh, elements come in, right? So, uh, yeah, I would say that that's the biggest difference between the first and second books. But um, you know, hopefully, people will find them a worthwhile read, anyways. Absolutely. Um... I want to dive into the nuts and bolts as a writer. What, and I'm sure it's different for each manuscript, but um, how much do you typically cut out from the first draft to the final uh, manuscript version? Oh, I'm glad you asked that because it yeah. was. A I want to know how much fat you had because I. <laughs> it, was a, it was a huge amount. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we like we were coming up to. I, I say we, my editor Rick and I. Um, he was always we were always in touch. Um, because like he essentially commissioned me to to do this right. Like I had to pitch him the idea, and I had to explain to him my plan, and we had to develop this this this, this sort of um, writing plan essentially for the story, right? Um, so he knew what the whole story was. He knew what was going to happen and so on. There were no surprises for him in that sense. But when I was writing it out, um, I spent from January of 2021 to about about the end of May 2021 writing the whole first draft. Uh, so about five and a half, six months. And uh, our target, you know, for a first draft was, you know, 100,000 words max. And it ended up being 123,000, which was like way too long. And I, I remember emailing him when I was like at about 110. And I said, dude, sorry, this is going to be too long. And uh, he said, that's OK. We got time to edit it and all that. Uh, so, yeah, one, 123 uh, in the first draft and the final printed version uh, is about 88, 88,000. So, yeah, looking at more than 30,000. Holy shit. Sure. That's a, yeah. Did that hurt? <laughs> to cut that much show. No, it didn't. I was relieved actually to take that much out <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, and, and a lot of it was like just, you know, what I was trying to do was just get as much out there as possible um, for the sake of being able to cut, like just to trim the fat, so to speak, or weed the garden or however you want to say it. Uh, and, and the parts that, you know, he suggested cutting were, were parts that had to go. It was just like, you know, when I talk about the walking through the bush part, like, 
if you read it and you think that's boring now, it was way more boring in the first drafts for sure, you know? Uh, so yeah, it was just, it was just cutting out like those, those moments of like, you know, unnecessary introspection, you know, really amping up the action and, and just trying to make it as good a pace as possible. Ultimately. I gotcha. Um, so obviously you're happy with the end result and yeah. you should be, you should be proud, man. Uh, what's oh, thanks, it? Man. Yeah, um, I honestly forget if the first one is with Harper Collins. Is is it? Uh, no, the first one's with ECW Press. That's okay. a independent publisher up here in Canada. Um, so they they have distribution in the states, but no standalone uh, edition. How does it feel to work with Har- Harper Collins for this one? Um, it was cool. You know, it was a really interesting editorial practice because largely they just took the work that uh, Rick did. Uh, you know, Rick is with Penguin Random House up here in Canada and he, you know, was main contact person. And uh, once my agent got the American deal, um, the, the, their intention was just to, you know, maybe do some tweaking after Rick did his, his work. Um, and they ultimately didn't do much at all. Uh, so it was, it was pretty hands off um, for the most part. Uh, but, you know, I was, pretty satisfied with that too like that there weren't going to be many changes between the canadian and american versions uh and and yeah just to have it out in the states as its own edition is is super cool i'm really appreciative of that and yeah they've been great to work with in terms of like the publicity and just getting it out there and everything yeah i was gonna ask if there were in the manuscript itself like different variations of it like you you said there's not many how many are we are we talking about just like so little even you might not even pick up on them oh like i'm they sent me a list of, of their tweaks and it was like a couple dozen maybe at most and it was just for you know vernacular uh, adjustments really mm. you know um i was expecting like to for them to change all the kilometers to miles and stuff like that but <laughs> they didn't do that either you know so i don't think you should Fahrenheit and everything <laughs> You you really shouldn't, man, because like that's part of that world, and yeah, exactly. You yeah. Trust a reader, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, there was one other thing with the covers. Now, what was your initial reaction with those? Because there's two. They're similar, but obviously yeah. they're not the same. Yeah, you know, I was I was pretty open to whatever designs came up. Like with the Canadian one, the designer is Kelly Ann Hill, um, and she she really wanted to um, have some sort of narrative elements on the cover. So mm-hmm. you see that on the Canadian version, you see like a forest setting, and you see like these orange markers tied to the trees, and and there's the moment in the book where they're following like bush markers, right? Yep. That's what that's supposed to be. And there's like a moon in the background and, and it looks really cool. Um, the American one, um, I, I, I just said, you know, whatever y'all think works. And and they came up with that beautiful uh, image, too. Uh, so, yeah, anything that sort of harkens back to nature and like can, you know, give the reader this atmospheric sense of of being in the forest and, and being on this journey, I think works really well. So it's cool to see both versions side by side. Definitely. Hmm. Um, and then. Again, I can't I really can't remember if this was in the first book, but with the second one, when you mix um the native tongue with English, I like that. And I, I like seeing I'm I'm seeing more of it now. Uh like Gabino Iglesias is a huge uh proponent of that. Uh as you should be, because if you're telling the story of whatever, insert whatever person from you know, whatever walk of life, um it, it's really just it's whitewashing it, isn't it? If it's just all English. So I really love how you did that, man. Was that might sound like a silly question again, but was that a hard decision on your part? Did you get any pushback for, for keeping it, uh, for trying to whitewash it or, or was it all pretty easy to, they're just like, yeah, it makes sense. That's a really good question. Um, it, it, you know, it goes back to the first one, to Moon of the Crescent Snow. Uh, w- when I brought that manuscript to ECW, to Susan Renouf, who edited that, um, the first, very first draft had all the instances of Anishinaabemowin, the language, uh, spoken in dialogue, right? And then the character would repeat it in English right after. 
And and Susan asked me, she said, well, why do you have them doing that? Um, it doesn't make sense and it's not realistic because if you have a person speaking that language to someone who understands it, they're not going to say the same thing in English right away. You know, it's kind of redundant and silly, right? And I said, oh, I know, I know. I just thought I should do that for readers who don't know it. And she's like, no, 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 there's other ways you can do that. You know, you can translate it in the context that follows or in the action that follows or in the English dialogue from the other person in conversation that follows and so on, right? And she said, no, just let your language be there, you know, um, represent it proudly, you know, be, you know, a proponent of it and let it stand in literature, you know, it, and it's only a few instances in a wider English text, but, you know, just, just let it be itself. And uh, that was like hugely empowering, you know, to have, you know, a white woman in her 60s from the big city of Toronto telling me, this guy originally from the res, that, you know, no, leave your language there. Let it be, you know, let, let everybody else figure it out on their own. I was like, wow, wasn't the response I was expecting at all, right? You that's know, awesome, you, man. Seriously, that's great. Yeah, when, when you take your little res story to the big city, right? You know, so, that's so cool. So when it, when it came time to work on the second book with, you know, new editor, new publisher, I, I told him how Susan and I worked and he, he thought that was cool. And there's a lot more of the language in the second one because, you know, it's a longer story, but also mm -hmm. like, you know, my language learning journey continues, right? I, I, I learned a bit of it as a kid, but I didn't learn it fluently. And my goal as an adult has been to learn it fluently, right? So in the last few years, I've made quite a few uh, steps uh, ahead. And, and I wanted to represent that in, in the story. Um, so there's more conversational dialogue of the language of Anishinaabemowin in, in the second book. And um, yeah, there was not no real pushback at all from, from anybody. Um, sometimes readers will say, you know, I just, I wish you had a glossary in there, or I wish, you know, there's translations and brackets or whatever. And, and I always say, like, I, I, I did not want to do either of those things. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to put a glossary in because that interrupts the flow of reading, right? Sure. Yeah. Someone will be reading and be like, oh, what does that word mean? Let's flip back to the glossary. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I wanted to be able to translate it in different literary ways, you know? Um, so, so there, of course, there are like some um, uh, pronunciation details people need to know but i put a i put a video on youtube to help people with that so uh oh, that's cool so, so yeah so for your listeners um if you're interested uh just google uh moon of the turning leaves pronunciation guide or, or look in youtube and you'll find it there nice and is there i got one more actually follow up and then candace uh is there uh different dialects in that in that tongue like from hmm. say people people down in uh I don't know, Michigan area, all the way up to parts of Toronto. Um, are there, there probably are, but like, what are they? What's the variations? Yeah, good, good question. There are, um, you know, and and I guess it, it, you know, it's as regional as as anywhere else. Uh, you know, like people in Massachusetts will talk differently than people in South Carolina, right? Mm, like, yeah, yeah. Um, there's different. It, it, it's it's not necessarily slang based. It's just slightly different pronunciations, sometimes different words for different things and so mm. on. Uh, but, you know, the, I tried to make it as universal as possible. You know, there's, from my community, there's a very specific dialect. Um, but from a community closer to here, closer to Sudbury, it's called Wequemkong. And it's one of the bigger uh, Anishinaabe communities and, and their dialects more widely used, especially in like learning resources. So I, I tended to lean more on that uh, Wequemkong dialect. Um, but, you know, at the core, all the grammar is the same. Um, all the basics uh, uh, are the same in terms of like, you know, pronouns, adjectives or whatever else. Right. So. So, yeah, there's universality there that I don't think people would get too lost on if if they're if they knew the language and were reading it. Oh, cool. Candice. Patrick. Candice. <laughs> Patrick. Okay, so um writing itself let's talk a little bit about that because isn't that what we all love to do yeah. <laughs> yeah um how do you write do you outline a whole lot do you wing it to start with and then kind of start to outline along the way like walk us through what your general process is because i know it probably changes a little bit from like each one but what do you generally do? 
Great question. Yeah, I generally outline, you know, uh, I, I feel more comfortable if I plan as much out as possible ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll write out just in point form, a uh, very basic sort of narrative structure, you know, uh, well, obviously going back a bit, it starts with the plot. So if I get the idea, what I'll do is I'll like write the plot in, in a sentence or two, right? And then I'll sort of leave that for a day or two. And then I'll just walk around and think about it. And I'll keep adding to it until like, I feel like I have, you know, maybe a page and a half that's, you know, could serve as like a, a pitch or a proposal for a novel. And, and if it feels like there's enough there for a novel, then I'll start building it out a lot more. And, and okay. you know, I'll write like, I'll, I'll write it out in scenes basically, right? Um, you know, from from the opening to like like the rising action to you know the context to and, and all the way up to the climax and resolution and so on, right? Um, and and that's not to say I I totally rigidly stick to that. You know, I allow myself to be flexible if if I need to. But before I actually start writing out, you know, uh, one of the biggest parts of my developmental process is the character profiles. You know, I'll mm -hmm. spend a lot of time just writing out who each person is, you know, uh, what they look like, you know, their their mannerisms, uh, their various character traits, their relationships with other characters, you know, their likes and dislikes and so on. Because I feel like I really need to know each character as deeply as possible before I sit down to actually write the story out. Because in some ways, you know, the more intimately you know the character, the more they can influence the, the plot or the writing as you go along. Like, you know, even though everything's mapped out, you still could get stuck at some point, right? Yeah. And that's when I like to turn to the characters themselves and think, you know, what would Evan do at this point? Or what would Nungos do at this point? Or whatever else, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's the, the the basic outlining, the the character development, and then, you know, some um, some research, too. Uh, that That's what I, I focus on at that point. Um, and, you know, any other sort of um, inspiration that, that I can derive, especially from like my natural surroundings. So I do a lot of walking out in the bush and um, I spend a lot of time on the water and so on. And I find that really like inspiring, especially for Moon of the Turning Leaves, because it's, you know, predominantly an outside story. Right. Yeah. As, as it goes through through the landscape and so on. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's all planned out. And, you know, to sort of go back to you know, the whole writing process of this last one, I've spent probably from from May of 2020 to to December of that year, um, doing all of that doing all of that uh, planning and outlining and so on. And mm -hmm. as mentioned, in January 2021 was when I wrote the first draft. So so yeah, I, I had a front load that uh, that that harder work, I think, and, and then the writing from there. Nice. Okay, so rituals um a lot of us have something we have to have when we write whether it's a snack or a drink or music on in the background or a window open nearby do you have any of those that you like absolutely need or are you just like i can sit down and write anywhere with anything <laughs> no there there are things i definitely need uh it always starts with a walk you know um after I take my kids to school and daycare, I come back home and then go walk for maybe 15 minutes to half an hour. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, that just helps me, you know, get into, I guess, the the mental groove of, of being uh, ready to sit down for a while and do some writing. Um, and then, you know, when I get back home, I'll maybe listen to a song or two from like a favorite musician uh, and then sit down to write. And, and like, I don't, spend more than like two hours writing you know i'll get up and do something else like mm -hmm. you know chores around the house or um you know e administrative emails or something like that right yeah. um and and i think when i get to those points where i'm, I'm stuck uh i always step away and, and try to do something else like like play guitar or you know maybe watch an episode of something um or or again like i said like shoveling snow or doing the dishes or something like that right so yeah. i think those mundane like daily tasks are part of my ritual too because it, like it, it detaches me from the process but also grounds me in my home at the same time and yeah. and i think my i guess just general practices as a human being you know uh so yeah it is very there are some some very specific things that I do in that self-contained time between like 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. when I drop off my kids and I pick them up again at the end of the day. Yeah. 
So how about when you reach that all important moment at the end of the book and you write those last two words, the end, what do you do? Do you have anything? Do you have something that's like, okay, I'm going to write the end and let me get my drink. Let me, let me call everybody in. Like, what do you do when that moment is there? You're like, I'm done. (laughs) That's an awesome question. Yeah. Like there is, you know, there's like such, um, yeah, such a visceral sort of reaction I have to actually like closing the the top of the laptop, you know, like it's, it's, it's an accomplishment to, to actually yeah. do that at that point, you know, um, you, you feel it, right? And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll turn on some, some very loud music for sure. Um, have a drink of something like pro- probably a beer, you know, uh, and just, yeah, just celebrate, you know, um, probably go outside for a walk again too. Cause you know, I like to bookend the whole process with that. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, some very specific things. But yeah, it's so celebratory, right? As as you all know, it's it's a cool, cool feeling. Nice. Brennan, Patrick, either of you? I, I wanna jump back to the original question on process, because you did have a very detailed process, especially in comparison to those of us who just fly by the seat of our freaking pants. Um how, if at all, would you say that your background in journalism ties into your writing process? Oh, it's 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 big, you know, and and I think it, it's so regimented and so um, meticulously planned because of my background as a journalist, you know. Um, every day when I was doing stories for the news, like you have to really finally plan out everything you're going to do in order to successfully get a story done at the end of the day, right? And and you really have to manage time so uh, precisely in order to to get that done. Um, so I think that sort of bleeds into to working in, in fiction as well. But I do allow myself the flexibility to to take more time or less time here and there, you know. But I think just just having that uh, regimented uh, approach to it has you know um, has helped me get it done. But at the same time. I find that I've really, uh, I think, not, not necessarily confined myself to that process, but but maybe have become a little too reliant upon it. And I do want to start, you know, flying up from the seat of my pants, you know, here and there. You know, I, I do want to, my, my next story that I want to do, I just want to sit down and, and write it and see where it goes. Because, you know, I it, it's liberating to be able to do that. And, and I admire people who can. And and I'm excited about the prospect of of trying it out, you know, because yeah, it's just like tapping into something that's intangible, um, something that um, you know, is maybe indescribable too. And it's also a very beautiful thing to just harness whatever is out there and like channel it through your fingertips and then onto the screen, you know, um, rather than just thinking about every single little detail ahead of time and trying to plan it all out, you know. So, yeah, I'm excited to try that out. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of like allowing myself to, uh, you know, to be flexible in that sense at this point, too. That's cool, man. So uh, we're going to start wrapping down with uh, where can people follow you? Yeah, uh, I, I guess I do most of my social media on Instagram. So you can find me there at Wab. That's at W-A-U-B. Uh, still on Twitter slash X, you know, or whatever it's going to be called next year. At uh, the same handle at uh, W-A-U-B. And uh, you can find me on Facebook, too, at Wab Gijic Rice. Um, yeah, those are the three ones. And, and, you know, I have a blue sky and a threads account too. Uh, I don't use those as much, but, um, yeah, you know, just, uh, find me anywhere on social media, reach out, always happy to chat with anybody who has come across anything that I've done. And I'm just uh, grateful for the opportunity to have connections for sure. You know, and, and then that's why I love staying in touch with y'all. Cause you know, I see all the exciting things you're up to on social media and I'm just like, oh, you guys are you guys are like living the dream, you know. You get to have these chats all the time, which is, is super cool. It's fun, and eventually, sir, you and I hopefully get to work together as editor yeah. and writer. Oh man, yeah, we, yeah, definitely. That uh, I'm telling that, you, that would be my that you're you're just like all the way up there. So oh, I'm throwing that out there live <laughs> well, on air. <laughs> um, where can people follow you, Brennan? Sorry, I almost skipped you. I had a brain fart. I was thinking about working with Wob. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay you are you are forgiven uh 
the majority of the social media places uh, at Brennan LaFaro. I will tell you that my social media manager has been skimping lately. Uh, they is probably need to be fired. It is me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this- um, you can follow me on all the social media networks under Candace Nola, or you can follow me under Uncomfortably Dark. You can follow me at PR McDonough. Um, follow Shud Dead Headspace. Um, and final thoughts, Wob. Uh, just, you know, heading into a pretty wild year everywhere in the world, you know, up here in uh, where we are in Northern Ontario, we've had like our mildest winter with uh, the least snowfall, you know, in, in a really long time. So, oh, wow. you know, those things can be a little bit unsettling, you know, uh, so I, I don't know, like I always just tell people uh, or try to advise people just to, you know, stay close to home, keep your loved ones close and look out for each other, be kind to each other. And uh, always remember we're, we're in this together in our communities. Right. And uh, just always uh, appreciate any opportunity to connect with anybody anywhere. And, you know, I commend uh, that headspace for bringing communities together. It's a beautiful thing. Thanks, man. Um, I just felt, really lucky to be able to talk to you the first time with brennan and it's cool to form a friendship with you because like seeing you like you're a family man i love that i love seeing pictures of your boys and whatnot like i I remember you posted recently one of your boys with their braids and i'm like that's so cool that's that's really such a talent man um yeah final thoughts on uh let's go with you candace um, final thought to me, um, basically just thank you for your time here tonight and the novel, of course, is fantastic. Um, I am going to read part one. I haven't read it yet. I enjoyed part two, I suppose, even though it is a standalone, but I do want to go back and read part one because i think after i do that i'm going to read part two again and hopefully you'll be writing part three by then (laughs) hint hint um and then i can finish (laughs) the storyline but now um just thanks you know it was a nice chat and i think this one is going to do well so thank you thank you yeah it's one of the more popular episodes like you're up there with peter strom and chuck polinick um you you have obviously a pretty cool following too uh brennan go ahead sir final thoughts i mean as always we're we're very thankful for your time thanks for hanging out with us on a wednesday night uh but but i I love your little pitch about bringing communities together because yeah that's absolutely what the three of us have in mind and if we can uh get uh, a hardo horror reader to go out and pick up moon of the turning leaves because they like that idea of that slow burn build toward that, you know, violence. Um, and it's a book that might not have crossed their radar. Otherwise, like, Hey, that's what we're here for, man. So yeah. thanks for hanging out. And we, uh, we would love to have you back again. Oh, or whatever time. you'd like to come on and talk about. Anytime. Yeah. Just, it's just an honor to join you all. Thank you very much. Same for me. This came in my head. I think yesterday with after reading a second book by you, your writing's like a volcano. Like it's really aesthetically pleasing, but there's pressure building up. And then when it explodes, it's like, oh Jesus Christ, who the hell's alive? <laughs> Patrick, your metaphors are that. like a volcano. <laughs> I'm no Joe Lansdale, but I'll, I'll, I'll get some point across one day. Yeah, I mean, like, my, I love that you're back in here to talk with us and the idea of whatever you write next. I mean, we want you back, buddy. Um, if you've enjoyed this talk, I implore you to seek out his first book, his second one, or your collection. Um, I'm going to butcher the title. I remember Sweat, Sweat Lodge, I believe, was in the title. But what? what uh, oh, yeah. Midnight, Midnight Sweat Lodge. That's it. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I mean, check that out, too. Good writer. Uh, and there's plenty more to come. You're still a young man. So next episode is 237. That's with Drew Huff. We're going to talk about her uh, 
our debut book, Freeburn. And as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for joining us.